Now I'd like to introduce to the stage Dan Goods and David Delgado. They are visual strategists at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And when I first heard about their work and the fact that there are visual strategists at NASA, I flipped and uh, have been following their work ever since. And then I got the opportunity to meet Dan in Irvine, California a little over a year ago at the NACFI conference and knew that they would be great speakers to have here today. And um, they're going to talk about their latest project, the Museum of Awe. So thanks so much for um, being here and about uh, getting the opportunity to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry guys, getting set up here. <laughs> oh, this clip fell off. Uh, well, thank you so much um, for having us here. Um, Dr. Hood, Allison, um, Aphrodite, that was awesome. But it's, it's been really great to um, be here, especially to get a tour and to find out about what goes on here and just sort of uh, learn more about the whole idea of how um, uh, thinking about systems can be applied to all of the things that you do. Um, there it is. Howdy. <laughs> Um, my name is David Delgado, and uh, this is Dan Goods. And um, we uh, want to talk to you a little bit today about a project we've been working on, been thinking about, and um, yeah, it's called the Museum of Awe. And we're just sort of fascinated by this because we are fascinated by the complexities of the natural world and um, how it's continuously unfolding, right, through the work and the research that everybody's doing. And that those discoveries um, are, are amazing. And we love this quote. It's uh, uh, by this person, Eden Philpotts, the universe is full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. And I love that because there's such a sense of hope in that, you know, is that here we are inside this universe, and we're trying to make sense of it all, you know? And we have this capacity to learn from the people before us and continuously grow. And so um, that's, that's sort of the wits part, right? And um, as everything unfolds, it's not only about um, learning about what is, right? But it's the adventure of thinking about what could be. And um, we wanted to show you um, how we've been sort of thinking about those things. And, uh, and then we'll get to the idea of the Museum of Awe. It's right on the top. Am I on? No. Yeah, there we go. OK. All right. Awesome. Do I need to start over, or did you hear like the first part? <laughs> OK. You, okay, you want to start? OK, great. So <laughs> I will start over. That's great. Uh, so yeah, David and I both went to art school before we got to NASA, as you know, many NASA people did, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, no. Um, so uh, I studied graphic design. David studied advertising. We went to a school called Art Center College of Design. And uh, I, I was uh, supposed to do branding for a little grocery store. And it's called Galco's. It's in LA. And they sell 500 kinds of soda. And uh, I was trying to do what a good graphic designer is supposed to do. You're supposed to be able to do logos. And I'm awful at logos, so I was really struggling. And uh, I had one of these special kinds of people that hopefully you've met in your life. He's the kind of person that like looks inside your soul and just like rips it out and then like shows it to you. And you're like, oh, that's who I am, right? And, and this is what I'm supposed to do. And he, he kind of did that with me. He said, Dan, you're just too practical and you need to go play because you, you know, you're just kind of stuck in your little box. And, and he said, but you're so practical that you'll take the impractical things that you do when you play and you'll make them practical. 
And it was a little hard for me to like manage everything that he was saying, but he told me to go play. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go do that. And so, so uh, the essence of this place is, this, is the bottle, the glass bottle, because if you have soda in an in a aluminum can, they use corn syrup instead of sugar cane, and the aluminum can just isn't good for, for the soda. And so the, the, the glass is what's, what's important. So I, I just started to play with glass and started to make these different sculptures, and I thought maybe I could put them all, all on, top of this, on top of their building and light them up in different ways, but I've loved the way in which when you blow on a bottle, it makes, you know, it, uh, it makes that beautiful noise, right? And so I thought, well, what if I like stuck these on top of my car and I drove around, you know, would it make music? And uh, it says, does not work. It looks pretty cool though. So uh, that didn't work. But, um, and then, then I started to play around more with it and I thought, oh, what if I had my friend kind of push it up and down, would that help? And that didn't work either, but eventually I got the right angle and the right distance and it made this beautiful noise. And it go, woo, 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 about 20 or 30 miles an hour. And I thought, oh, that'd be super cool if you put them on a taco truck stand and drove around and it'd make music, right? And, and so that, that was a cool idea. And then uh, my friend, uh, she has perfect pitch. And she'd go around all the bottles and made this musical scale for me. And, and I don't know anything about music, but I thought, oh, it'd be really cool to make like a pipe organ out of these things, right? And, and so uh, that's sort of the way that we work is that, that we have no idea how to do things that we want to do. But uh, once we find an idea that we love, we ask lots of questions and we, we talk to lots of people and we collaborate and, and uh, hopefully we can figure out how to do stuff. And so I didn't know anything about what this was when I sketched it out, but I, I knew there must be air and there must be something like that. And someone told me that I was a solenoid and I was able to end up making this, this thing. And, and uh, what's, what's kind of strange is this is actually what got us to the Jet Propulsion Lab. And so this is uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, there's 5,000, 6,000 people there. It's, uh, it's in Pasadena, it's right next to the Rose Bowl, it's right uh, next to the, the foothills there. And uh, a lot of super amazing smart people there doing all sorts of different things. And, and a lot of people know about the rovers landing on, on Mars, so our friends built those. Uh, people use telescopes you know, to look at stars and galaxies far away. And, and what most people don't know is that we actually do a lot of studying the Earth. And so there's 19 satellites that study the Earth, and, and JPL has a lot to do with, with many of those different things. Um, but I, I ended up, uh, maybe I'll, I'll step back, I, I ended up uh, meeting the, uh, the, uh, the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab, and, and I had two seconds to sell myself. And, and I said, wouldn't it be cool if, if artists were involved in, in brainstorming future missions? And he was like, oh, that sounds wonderful, that's great. And then he literally had to leave to the next meeting, and he just kind of like walked away. <laughs> and I was like, no, come back here, I need to talk more. What do you mean? Yes, that'd be great. And uh, so I'd been sending my resume in uh, Next Day Air, because it's like human nature, you have to open like a FedEx, like nobody throws away a FedEx. And so, uh, but I wasn't around. <laughs> That's right, right? Yeah, so I, I wasn't around, but my wife was, she, she went down to the store. They didn't have letter size envelopes. They only had gigantic envelopes. And so she put my resume and, and little letter into this big envelope and it was right after 9-11. And, and uh, so he got, the, he got this giant thing. And, and to this day, he remembers getting that and he, he uh, you know, he didn't exactly know what to do, and I kind of bugged him a bit, and he sent it on to some folks, and, and they said, well, um, you know, you went to art school. You must maybe know how to do animations. Could you please, could you do animations for us? And, and I said, you know, I will do anything to work at a place like this. Uh, but this bottle project, this is like what I'm really passionate about. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, he kind of looked at me a little funny, but um, he, he said, you know, I don't really understand what it is that you do, but uh, I'll give you six months and we'll see what happens. And so uh, that was about 15 years ago. And uh, now have this amazing team of uh, various people from lots of different backgrounds. David's a huge part of it. And, um, and we, we, uh, we're sort of like a little creative agency within a big city of, of the Jet Propulsion Lab. And we do a lot of different things. Uh, one, one area we like to talk about is where we help them think through their thinking. So they're working on lots of complicated problems and um, you know they're kind of used to talking to their peers and they ask certain sets of questions but we ask lots of different kinds of questions and we rearrange information in different ways 
And uh, hopefully after, the, we, we are involved in a lot of brainstorming sessions and that sort of thing. And, and I think that when they walk away, they have a deeper understanding of what they're doing because they've been asked different questions about it and at the end of the day. And then there's this whole other area that we call sneaking up on learning. And, and that's sort of what a lot of the, the next portion is, is all about. And so when I, when I first got there, they were working on these mission ideas to find planets around other stars. So not just our, our planets, you know, other stars. And, and uh, they would tell me all these big numbers, and I wasn't very good at math, and I didn't quite understand it all. But I, I, I had to sort of create something to help me understand what they were talking about. And so uh, this is a grain of sand. And uh, I, I imagined, what if that's our galaxy? We live in the Milky Way galaxy, right? Uh, with hundreds of billions of stars. But what's cool about being at JPL is I could take that grain of sand and ask someone, could you drill a hole into it for me? And so um, they actually used the carbide drill bit to drill this little hole right in there. So that hole is where we live, but it's also where we found thousands and thousands of planets around other stars just within our little galaxy. And our technology is so bad that we can't see most of the things that are there. So we're going to find tens of thousands of planets within that little teeny tiny hole, let alone the rest of the galaxy. And when I was first doing this, um, you needed six rooms of sand to show all the other galaxies that we know about. So each one of those have hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, but just about two months ago or three months ago, it's turned to 60 rooms of sand. So, so uh, 10 foot by 10 foot cubes yeah, yeah, of yeah. sand. So it's a, it's a big place out there. And so I would do these installations with lots of, of sand. And then there'd be a magnifying glass. And you'd look under it. And, and you either get a sense of like, wow, I'm super insignificant. But uh, hopefully, I, I, I really hope that you look at it and go, wow, you know, maybe, maybe we are significant. Um, yeah, and so uh, if you go right to the next slide, Dan, I'll start from there, because maybe this is a better one. This is a, a beautiful hallway, as you can tell. Yeah, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, you see the little thing there that says JPL. Um, it's one of the new buildings that, um, that was built there. And right at the end of the hallway is an office for, it's the Exoplanet Exploration Office. And I love exoplanets, because when I first found out about them, it sort of felt like it was like uh, science fiction. And then I realized it was real. <laughs> and, um, but there's the Exoplanet Exploration Office. And they were really excited because there was a famous scientist who was going to come who was a big researcher and had a lot to do with finding exoplanets. And so they wanted to do something just to celebrate the idea of not only the number of exoplanets, but the huge range of diversity of these different planets, because they have just really strange characteristics. You know, some um, are, uh, they rain molten glass. You know, some are, you know, floating alone in space without a, a parent star. And some have these just really bizarre features that sort of defy the general, the logic of a planet that we have thought about in the past, right? And so sort of opening up this whole new world of thought. And, um, and what we did, there's Sarah Seeger who's coming there. Um, and what we did is we wanted to really figure out um, what we could do to celebrate these things. And when you start thinking about all of the characteristics, and you know that they're real, these places are there, you start to think about, well, how far away are they? And um, what does it take to get there? And do you think we will ever get there? And these are like big questions, right? Of course, we want to get there. And so that desire to go um, really kind of let us uh, play with our imagination and think about you know, real basic questions, but, but ones that really kind of put us in that place. You know? What would it be like to live on a planet with two suns? You know? What would it be like to kind of visit a planet where the plant life has evolved to reflect a different kind of light. It photosynthesizes in a different way. Or on a planet where the gravity is so extreme that it just can pull you down, you know? And um, how would you celebrate that idea of being like, you know, in a place where everything's really heavy? Maybe, you know, skydiving would be a great thing. And so when we started to ask these questions of putting ourselves in these places, the natural the next step was, well, what about if we you know, answered that request of how we celebrate these idea of exoplanets by making travel posters? You know? What if we kind of look back at sort of the days long ago and travel, you have these beautiful uh, you know, WPA posters of visiting the natural, uh, uh, national parks, and sort of using that style to really talk about going to places that we are just barely able to 
uh, detect now. And so uh, what we did is we, we did that. And so uh, we put some posters up in the hallway that kind of celebrate that idea. And uh, we wanted just to have fun with it. But we really wanted to like really hone in on one scientific characteristic of each place. Not give too much information, but just one thing. So here on Kepler 16b, it's a place with two suns. So we said, hey, that'll give you two shadows probably, right? And then just to complete the kind of fun of it all, we always add a little cheesy tagline at the bottom. <laughs> but it's like, where your shadow always has company. Or you know, a place where you have these crimson forests, um, you know, where the grass is always redder on the other side. Or you know, what would it be like to um, go to a super Earth, which is just as much more massive, and sort of thinking about that idea of just uh, the joy of falling through the atmosphere there. And so um, it was really fun, but the funny thing was is that uh, we really made this for something very small. And we put them up in the hallway. Oh, <laughs> this is going, going crazy. We put them up here. in the hallway. You have to go way back. Yeah. Yeah. You put them up in the hallway, and um, people started um, noticing them and tweeting them and um, you know, taking pictures of them. And then once um, they were released to the public, um, people started reacting. I mean, everybody wanted these posts, which is the strangest thing, because we made them for a visit of a scientist. And all of a sudden, the whole world wanted to talk about them. And I think what was really interesting to us, because we were blown away by it, was, of course, we felt great that it was about the posters. But the posters weren't really it, of course. It's the desire to be more, right? It's that desire to have the opportunity to grow beyond Earth, to grow beyond in ways that we may not even be able to imagine right now, but somehow we get there, you know? And that desire is sort of a shared desire by so many people. And I think that potentially is what gave rise to all of the media that went out. So if you go to the, oh, and then this is it's kind of funny too. So once we started doing this, um, you want to give that to me? Yeah, well, no, <laughs> it, it's just a little, sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, sensitive. It's sensitive. <laughs> sensitive technology. So um, no, we had people from other countries asking if we could, they could translate them for us. And then um, you know, it's kind of funny is that we found out about a whole different economy that's out there about you know finding stuff that's available for free and then selling it for you. Yeah. But they don't actually <laughs> give any of the money back. We don't get uh, any of that. So yeah. Be, <laughs> because um, you know uh, anything that we do for NASA um, is whiskey flask. Anybody? Yeah, we, you, know, you know it turns out you can get whiskey flasks and ties, and um, it was just really great. So we really enjoyed watching this on a daily basis of what new thing they were creating with the posters yeah. on it. Um, and if you go to and so we made a whole bunch more. Um, it was kind of fun. The director of our lab, uh, former director, a beloved uh, director there, Charles Alachi, asked if we could make a whole calendar for him. Uh, that he could give to the lab. And so we um, not only uh, kept it to exoplanets, but we sort of uh, thought about our planets too in our system and thought about what it would be like to go to these places and, and followed that same, uh, the same sort of general idea of if, um, and we, Dan called it sneaking up on learning. We're always interested in getting people to understand something, but if you try to give too much, it just becomes too overwhelming. So there's, you know, each one thinks about one small aspect of each place that could be memorable. And um, it was just really a lot of fun. In fact, um, this is the most recent one. This is TRAPPIST-1. Um, it's actually a very significant discovery in exoplanet world because of these uh, numerous uh, seven Earth-like planets that are you know, going around its parent star. Um, it's a red dwarf star, had red light. And so this one was the first time we'd done a poster that really was about a system rather than a place. And so we struggled for a while trying to figure out how to put all of those planets in there. And so uh, we finally came upon the notion that if, if they were sort of a, a sunset moment where you see the, the light, almost like crescent moons, um, you could stand on planet E, which is an Earth-like planet, potentially with water, and, um, and then see the two closer um, in the, the two cl planets closer to the star in the foreground, and then farther in the back, you see the other ones too. And so, um, so it's voted best habitable zone vacation. So <laughs> <laughs> this is the planet hopping, planet hopping um, uh, flight uh, vacation that you can have with that. And what's really kind of important and special about this discovery is that um, it's close enough to study in more detail. And so when the James Webb Telescope goes up, um, or other technology is going to go up that's going to be close enough to potentially detect atmospheres, to uh, potentially really kind of get a really much better understanding of how different planetary systems work. And so it's super exciting. 
Uh, yeah. All these things are uh, free online. They're super high res, so you can print them out like eight feet tall if you want. Uh, if you just uh, Google NASA travel posters, you'll, you'll find your way there. Uh, we ended up getting lots of emails and, and uh, you know, interesting feedback from various people. And, uh, but but this, was, this was my favorite one here. Uh, I'd like to acquire the posters so I can hang them in our child's nursery. I was like, that's great. Uh, my wife isn't pregnant now, but we plan to start trying in the next few months. I like my son and daughter to grow up dreaming big. So, you know, that, 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 that's what it's all about, right? Like, that's what we want to do. Dan just typed back, T-M-I. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, exactly. Thank you, sir. Too much of a... We sent him, we sent him the posters. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, one of the things that, that we really got excited about and, and started to really think about as this kind of project grew was the relationship between um, the imagination and our desire to explore, you know? And you know, you see a lot of that with science fiction out there, and a lot of the people actually involved in you know aerospace engineering and things love that. But we wanted to participate in that ourselves in a way that um, you know, if you, I love. I went to a conference one time and I saw this futurist Stuart Candy um, showing this graph, and and it all made sense to me because this is his chart of this cone of the future, right? And all of these little points of dots in the future are potential things that could happen, right? And as you go farther down the cone, of course, it gets wider, the potential gets greater, but there's, there's less certainty, right? And so we thought just from the perspective of these posters and just a general idea is like, can we, can we design out here, you know, and, and make things that are farther down that cone to really kind of create a tangible, some tangible evidence of what could be, you know? so that it draws people to that and it gives them a sense of someday we can do this and it requires us to get there. And so it becomes sort of a, in a way, like a navigation tool of um, some place we could eventually end up someday, but it doesn't happen without the work of, um, of our intellect and, and the idea of being able to solve huge problems. And so that idea of being sort of architects of a potential future is something that really resonated with us and, and felt um, really good to be able to participate in. And so uh, if you, uh, what we really, really loved about that is if you go to the next slide, Dan, is, a, is a, it reminded me of these books. Do you guys remember these? Uh, choose Your Own Adventure books. So much fun and, and uh, you know, you go through and you choose your own adventure. And um, this is one of the charts of how you get to all of these potential endpoints, you know. And it's if <laughs> like you make a decision here and you go to this and, look and go to, die. look back, die. <laughs> Don't look back, <laughs> jump to death. And, um, <laughs> and just really loved it. And so this, this general idea of, of uh, playing a role in that part of helping to get people to a certain spot through the way that you communicate um, the desirable future. Um, became became kind of a fun jumping off point for us. And um, what's next? I think we're, we're, oh yeah. So this was something that was a lot of fun. We wanted to share this with you. Uh, I mentioned um, a person named Dr. Charles Alachi, who was the director of JPL for 15 years. He was the one uh, I sent the giant letter to. The one, yeah, uh, uh, you know, for, yeah, that's right. <laughs> And it originally hired Dan and, and um, was a huge supporter of the arts and was uh, just a beloved figure at JPL. And um, it was time for him to move on. Uh, he was going to retire last year. And so um, there was a group of people at JPL that asked us to think of something that we could do to help celebrate all the great things that he had done for the lab. And so he's done so many things. And we were thinking about that. And, and he's from Lebanon. And so, we looked at the Lebanese flag, and there was a tree on it. And I didn't know too much about what that was, but you know, I, we looked into it, and it, and it was it turns out it's the cedar of Lebanon. You know, and these, of course, have this tremendous history. Cedar of Lebanon is written in the Bible many times, and I think the reason why that is, of course, it's written in meta, very metaphorical ways, but in its essence, it is the was the greatest building material of its time, right? Cedar tree, you've got this very intense aroma, bugs don't like it. So it became the, the tree of kings and pharaohs, right? And so, um, and I think due to the, those features, they also became over sort of collected. And some of the great forests of Lebanon were just deforested. And so there's still a few cedars there, but not very many. And so we thought, wow, you know, I wonder if we could get one. And, um, you know, <laughs> And, and just being sort of naive sometimes uh, helps with the project to move forward. So we thought, well, you know, hey, let's get Dr. Alachi's Cedar of Lebanon and we'll plant it here. 
And um, it, was, <laughs> it was really funny. So I, you know, I called up our local nursery, and <laughs> it turns out they didn't have one. So I was like, ah, shoot. But uh, we were lucky to have the support of, uh, there's an arborist at JPL. And um, she knew uh, she might be able to help. She did a lot of tree sourcing around the country. And it turns out we found three, actually. So we wanted, uh, there are some uh, different uh, variations of that species, Cedrus labani, um, that are more uh, common here in the United States. But we wanted the, like, we wanted the actual Cedrus labani tree. And so it turns out there was two up in a farm in Oregon and one in, in Pennsylvania. And, um, and so we brought one down and we planted it. And so this is the picture of a 14-year-old cedar of Lebanon at JPL. Um, it's just a beautiful tree, but it, you've, if you've had a chance to see them, like the illustration you saw earlier, they grow huge, right? They get to be you know, over 100 feet tall with these magnificent sort of wide spreading branches. And they're, they're really a, a sight to behold. Um, but when we when this showed up, we were like, "What? <laughs> so skinny, and it's kind of like, you know." And, we, <laughs> and we, we were a little bit worried. And then you know, it dawned on us is that um, this species of tree has an incredible potential within it. And I think that the reason why everybody loved it so much for all of its various things. Um, but this is a young 14-year-old, and. And it's sort of, in a way, is a lot like us, right? Is that we have 14-year-olds. I used to be 14 years old, and I probably looked a little like that, too, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we thought, well, actually, isn't that a beautiful thing, though, that it's, it's 14 years old, it's 30 feet tall, and it's got a, about 2,000 years of life ahead of it, you know? And so we thought, I think maybe we're thinking about it in a different, uh, the wrong way, you know? What if instead of it representing the past, it represents the future? You know, that, and Dr. Lachi was very much about that. He also said things like, like dare mighty things was a quote that he used quite a bit. And so we thought, well, maybe this could be a dare to the lab. Is that, you know, plant it in the ground. And, and, and so what we did to create that dare, if you go to the next slide, is um, surrounding the tree is, is a plaque to commemorate him. A plaque. Yeah, we got funded for a plaque. Yeah. So they they we were thinking they were going to get something like but this. But it's a, it's, it's a diameter of the future tree, of how big that tree trunk could grow when it reaches full maturity. And, um, and it's about you know, nine feet in diameter. And so we thought, um, if it can live for 2,000 years, potentially, uh, maybe you know, in 2016, um, here we are. We have the tree, and it's about an eight-inch diameter. And 2016, it'll be up to nine feet. And what will it take for us to let that thing grow? And what will it take for us to allow it to grow, not only just by itself, but that it also that means the environment around us? You know? And so um, we kind of squeezed that in as part of the dare. We, you know, we knew we had to write dare mighty things on there. But what we discovered was that the greatest mighty thing that we could imagine was that we could still be alive and thriving in 2,000 years to celebrate that tree as it is fully mature. And so um, this is there at the lab, and um, it's uh, hopefully um, still alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's probably the, the has, it's a tree that's cared for. Yeah, for sure. yeah, and what's beautiful is that all the Lebanese, you know, they, they cry. They literally cry when they see it. And so when we first presented it, um, you know, a guy came up, and he, he was in tears. And, and he was like, you don't understand what you did. And, and that's, that, was, that was a beautiful moment. So, uh, so David and I have um, lots of weird stories and that sort of thing. Uh, we, we, uh, the second day that he got to JPL, uh, oh, sorry, I, I think I skipped Oh, ahead. yeah, OK. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, I really think this chart is so funny. I have to tell you guys. It's so great because the, I, pie charts, you know, are, if you go like very businessy. But this is a pie chart that it, this, it's, uh, shows you everything in the universe. <laughs> and so um, it's great because, you know, I love it because. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we're, we're in that little black slice. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just think it's so great because, you know, out of all of the things that we think we know and all of the things that we get excited about and all of the things that we feel like we're in charge, um, here we are, and um, you know, 70% dark energy, you know, 25% dark matter. You have three, you know, 0.6 intergalactic gas, and this tiny, teeny little slice is what basically everybody thinks the universe is, right? So the stars and the things you can see, the matter, right? 
And um, just really love this too, because you know, as we go on, we think about architects of the future, and everybody's pushing new territory and inventing new things. Um, what are the chances of this being more divided, right? So it's probably pretty great that this will be divided up more and more and more. And, um, and inside, what I, what I think I really like about this is that, you know, we call it dark matter and dark energy. And, and to some extent, maybe that could be interpreted as we don't fully know yet also, right? Um, because this could maybe have some more slices as our technology grows and, and things. But, but we think that uh, we will do that. And I think inside, what about, like going back to the quote in the beginning of magical things, right? The universe is full of magical things. As we grow and we continue to learn, we discover things, it's going to help us understand, right? This thing will change. And that's why, you know, if you go to the next slide, what, what I really love about this quote is, is how much power one word has in it, right? And it's not the wits part that is powerful, but it's the universe is full of, of magical things. That means something that we are very excited about to see, right? Something that we may not fully understand, but is a part of reality, right? Um, at least that's the way I interpret it. But look what happens when you take out the word magical. It's like the universe is full of things patiently waiting for the, our wits to go sharper. It's like instantly that whole sentence just dies, you know? And sort of the power of it to me just uh, seems to go away. And so um, for us, I think, you know, the, the idea of being able to present um, portions of reality in a way that reconnects with people and gets them excited about living in this life is something that's really important to us. And um, yeah, just wanted to, uh, I forget what's on the Yeah, the next it's, it goes into the next story. Okay. So, so this is uh, a few years ago. This was uh, probably uh, 13 years ago. I think uh, this one was me over there. Yeah, we, right there. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Can you recognize this there? Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> what can you say? So it was actually the second day of work that David had. And uh, I called him up and I said, hey, do you want to go to Goldstone on an airplane? And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, Sounded and like a James Bond movie, so there, I was there. <laughs> there yeah. used to be an airplane that went uh, from Pasadena to a place called Goldstone, which is where they have one of the centers of the Deep Space Network. Deep Space Network are three, uh, three uh, different locations around the world. One's uh, on its way to Vegas, another one is in Spain, and another one's in Australia. And their ways, and they're equidistant from each other so that as the Earth spins, uh, if I'm trying to talk to you and I'm looking this direction, the next one will turn on. And then as that one can't uh, talk to you anymore, the next one will turn on. And so they used to have this airplane. It's not there anymore. But uh, we had this chance to go out there. And we're like, wow, you know, look at these amazing devices. You know? and, and these are the things that communicate to all the spacecraft that are what we call deep space. So anything from the moon beyond. And uh, you go out there, and, and it feels like there's lots of stuff going on. But it's like deathly quiet out there. <laughs> and it's just really bizarre. You, you have little lizards. Uh, there's some uh, big turtles that move very slow. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just like a really weird space out there. But, it, uh, but this whole experience really sort of um, uh, set the seeds for a couple of projects. But uh, again, this was like 13 years ago, something like that, a yeah. lo uh, long time ago. And, and uh, I just think recently. Mu well, but just much like Aphrodite, you know, we became in fa like fascinated with this idea of the presence of, of something you can't perceive. Yeah. You know? And, and the huge volume of it that you know is happening, but it's just beyond us. Yeah, you know? so it felt like, you know, like there's all this raining data all over us, but uh, we, we, don't, we don't perceive it, right? And so many, many years later, we ended up getting to actually do something about that. There's uh, this uh, really cool place at, at JPL. This is the uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the, they call it the center of the universe. It's, it's uh, where, let's see, make sure we actually move in there. Are we moving? Hello? There we go. Okay, so uh, this is sort of mission control at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and uh, and this one room is where all the data from all three centers go through that one room, and so came up with this idea of being able to create a sculpture where uh, we actually plug into the real data, and when lights come down, that means that at that second we're receiving data from a spacecraft, and when lights go up, that means that we're sending uh, signals to a spacecraft. And um, all the, the amount of light that you see represents how much data is going back and forth. So Voyager can hardly send anything back and forth. It's just like little teeny tiny drips of data go back and forth, whereas other spacecraft can send lots of information back and forth, and so it'll feel different. 
And so all day long, uh, this is in the director's building, and, and so uh, he can walk through every day and go, you know, this is what's happening right now. And so we, we call this the pulse because it's really about the heartbeat of space exploration, this communication that goes back and forth. And what was really fun, when he retired, we ended up making a little tiny version for him. So he has it at Caltech on his desk, which is kind of fun. So that was a very um, uh, visual way of showing information, but uh, we wanted to explore with something else, maybe something with sound, uh, because we're, we're thinking, you know, out in that desert, you know, what if we closed our eyes and we could just listen and much like you hear a bird sort of fly across uh, the sky, maybe we could hear spacecraft flying across the sky. But we didn't have a project and we didn't have any money and nothing you know, kind of went with that. But eventually, many, many years later, we ended up having this opportunity to do something for a music festival. And, and we pitched the idea and they said, yes. And so uh, this is sort of the basic idea. Uh, I had met this uh, sound engineer who I, I said, uh, I was at. It was almost, almost, <laughs> exactly, there we go. I was at this, um, this party and I was, um, the guy said he's a sound engineer and said, oh, I've been, I've heard about one of these rooms where you can, it's sort of like surround sound on steroids where you can put a sound anywhere within a room. And he, and he laughed and he said, that's actually what I do all day long. <laughs> and I was like, no way. <laughs> so uh, he works for an engineering firm um, uh, for uh, where they do a lot of concert halls. And so he actually models what your building will sound like before they actually build the building. So uh, great sort of connection there, told him about that, and he's like, oh, this is great. And so this is sort of the idea is that there's a huge amount of speakers, um, but just like surround sound, you can place a sound anywhere around, and then we know where all the spacecraft are that are orbiting the Earth. And remember early on, I talked about the, uh, we have 19 satellites that help study the Earth, and so we wanted to map uh, all these different things to um, to the space. And so, um, so we, we kind of gave each individual spacecraft, uh, its own voice. So it's sort of like little birds or you know, animals that are flying around you. And, and so each one sort of has its own voice. And, and so we had this great idea, but then um, uh, David had this great insight of if you're doing a sound installation, like if you're gonna, you know, if the New York Times were to come by, like would they take a picture of a bunch of speakers? You know, it's kind of boring. And so like, how could you do something that's more like an object of wonder? You know, and, and we talked to a, a great architect, his uh, name is Jason Klamoski. He's at, uh, it's called Studio KCA. He's in New York, and he, and he came up with, um, with this. He came up with this idea of a, of a seashell. So a seashell, you listen to a seashell, right? But uh, in, instead of hearing the ocean, in, in ours, you hear the location of, of satellites. So each time you hear a sound, um, it took a while to get this right, but in that exact location, if you were to continue the point of your finger up 100 miles or so, um, that is the exact location of the spacecraft flying overhead. And the sound artist we worked with is named Shane Mirbeck, and um, he created the unique voices for each of the spacecraft. What was fun is that this really became a meditative space, a place where people go in there and they just kind of close their eyes and listen and really get a sense of like this, all this activity that's going on around. And uh, one of the sounds uh, represents the International Space Station and it sounds like a bunch of voices. And so that's the, uh, uh, whenever you hear those voices, that's when, when you know that you know, the internet, people are actually flying around you. And it was really beautiful. One night we went out uh, to this thing at, at dusk and I could actually see the International Space Station flying by and then we got to hear it at the same time. And that was a really beautiful moment. So uh, one cool thing about our team is that we're totally embedded in what goes on there. We're not, we're not like off on some, we're, we're not on you know, a communications team. We're actually in the systems engineering uh, division at JPL. And uh, that allows for more communication in, uh, in ways that maybe you wouldn't normally get a chance to. And, and um, this is a spacecraft called Juno. Juno is at Jupiter right now. But before it launched, um, we started to think about, well, what could we do at this moment in time? Because we didn't have a big enough rocket to just go all the way to Jupiter. We actually had to go out towards Mars and then turn and come back and then 
come back really close to the Earth and, and uh, use the gravity of Earth to slingshot us out to Jupiter. So this is a great moment where, you know, there's uh, this spacecraft that was way out in outer space and it, it is going to be coming right next to the Earth. And is there some way to communicate with it that's other than, you know, the deep space network? Is there some way to get a bunch of people involved? And so we started to, um, to think about social media, but maybe old school social media. Anyone, anyone was a ham radio operator or Morse code sort of thing? Oh, I see a couple. Yeah, okay, cool. Right. Okay, so um, uh, this is a little video that um, kind of talks about this particular project. And maybe if you can uh, put the house lights down a little bit more. This is my uh, transmit. Maybe it's some, something you can use on your It's just about five minutes long. The Juno experiment is something that a group of us came up with. The biggest challenge we had was we didn't know if this was going to work or not. If it works, you know, I'm part of history. <laughs> this is W6JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Hello, CQ, CQ, CQ. flyby is Juno's way of gaining some extra speed, changing direction so that its orbit can take it to Jupiter. He said, what if we actually sent something to Juno? I basically came up with the idea that we could send Morse code to Juno, enlist the support of amateur radio operators around the world. So the intent is to join amateur radio community together in a coordinated transmission from Earth to the Juno spacecraft as it flies by. The website would tell them, okay, key down now, then key up, transmit for 30 seconds. And that's how we would send a dit. Everybody knows Morse code is dit, 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 da, da. Well, it turns out to say hi to Juno, it takes four dits and space, and then two dits for the eye. I thought, wow, that's a neat thing to do, and they're gonna need a lot of people to pull this thing off. I said, I'm good to go. We're getting ready right now. Here we go. And now we are transmitting here. They could hear ham radio operators all over the world doing this, which was really remarkable. Everybody's doing this at the same time. Thousands and thousands of hams. With any luck, the Juno spacecraft will be able to listen and hear all these amateur radio transmissions. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at the data that's come down to see if we can put together that signal that says, hi, will it work? Who knows? the audio from Juno. I'd love you to listen to it. This sounds very cool. about what it is, it was really, really amazing. How many times do you get to say hi to a spacecraft that's swinging by your planet? To be a part of it, that was very great. More than thinking about what it means to me, I think it's, it's just such a great thing that humankind has the ability to think beyond our own environment. It's the curiosity, it's the adventuring spirit, I think, that the space program has given us. Hi, Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Hi Juno. Goodbye. Thank you.
Okay, take 17. We can put the lights back up. Thank you. Never mind this. <laughs> These aren't the droids Nothing you're looking for. Here. So uh, we get to have a lot of fun. Well, we, we do get to have a lot of fun at JPL. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of bureaucracy and various types of things. But um, uh, that's our day job. Uh, but in the evenings and weekends, we work on lots of other projects. And um, maybe I'll uh, go to this next one here. Yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, we did. Uh, we were asked to do a piece for a, a company out in, in Utah, and it was kind of a funny thing because uh, they they called us in and they said, "Hey, we'd we'd like to do something special in this particular place." And um, uh, we're a company. They made a bunch of uh, products that, but they they had this idea that word they kept on using was pristine. Can it can it be about think about the word pristine? So we're thinking about that. And then it was kind of interesting, and they say, you have this whole, this whole entire space you can use, right? I'm like, great, this is good. And you can use any, anything you want. And then we, we'd come back with a few ideas, and they would say, actually, well, we want to make sure you don't use the wall anymore. And then, and then we're like, oh my gosh, OK. And then so we come up with, with different kind of ideas. And, and then you know, they're you know, about things hanging and sort of sculptural hanging thing. We come back and then they're like, that is amazing. We love it so much. But we've thought about this really deeply and we sort of think we sh you shouldn't use the ceiling either. <laughs> the, their architect said that there's, it's very in, in, important that we maintain the integrity of the plane of the ceiling. And, and we three days before our final presentation. Right, right. So we were like, oh, man. But we, we um, during this time, like a lot of our ideas, we were very fascinated with water. And um, just the behavior of water, um, how it interacts with light. And, um, and, and so this was, a, I guess, a solution that fit within those constraints. But in some ways, we're really glad that we have them. And, and so what we did is, um, is this. And so... If you see this, you, you'll see this is walking in through the main door, corridor, um, you know, 18 feet up, uh, there's the ceiling um, that we are not supposed to disturb, right? But, <laughs> but we cut a big hole in it. And um, then we put a, like a, sort of like a fish tank, right? It's a big tank filled with water. And um, we cast a, a theater light um, just down through the water and um, sort of played with, we have the two robotic arms up in top sort of moving the water back and forth. So we had a chance to almost you know, choreograph different water and movement patterns in the way that it sort of bounced and reflected inside this tray. And um, in a way, it was a, a big experiment for us because we weren't sure about what it was going to do and how it was going to feel. Um, but what we really ended up liking was that um, it sort of felt like being underwater itself. And it sort of felt like seeing light come down through the clouds. And it felt like a whole bunch of things, but it wasn't like any of them, you know? And um, it was something that, um, you know, we're actually still working on, too, because this idea of water and, and just, uh, the, just the very nature of it and how it interacts with light, um, it spurred a lot of ideas. Um, so this, what was kind of fun is we, of course, didn't know how to do anything. And uh, we discovered that there were these DJ lights that already have like a pretty robust um, programming language that's meant to work with them. So we thought, whoa, what if we take out the light? You know, we can just remove all of the internal electronics and just use the motor. And so we sort of learned this, this language of control, the DMX controlling, um, and that allowed us to create a whole variety of different patterns um, that, um, that, you know, would, would change throughout the day. And, and, um, and one of the things where we'd like to do is actually have it be responsive too. So we've done a few versions of this. Uh, there's one, we've done this one here in, in Utah. We've done uh, one at the gallery at Art Center College of Design. Um, but we're continuing to think about how to, you know, evolve it to the we'd, next We'd phase. love to have uh, three, three, like, projected on the outside, like, three buildings, and then have, like, a little bowl of water with a sensor in it, so you just, like, go like that, and it goes <laughs> Always want to do that. So if you have three buildings, you know, let us know. So. Yeah.
Yeah. Someone had thought about for the kind of entertainment of humans, like the psychology of let's make a life world. Yes, exactly. So and you just said, plug and play. We'll just yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. could either make your own robot or you could like buy a two hundred dollar robot. And we're yeah. always looking, yeah. you know. I can't tell you the number of hours we I've wa you know, we wander around Home Depot looking at Man, the maybe, real story. The real that story is that we hired an unemployed lighting person to help us, <laughs> and uh, and he came up. He, he he said, "Well, you know, these things already have this stuff in it." But, uh, he's still yeah. unemployed, but uh, so, <laughs> but it was pretty fun. So yeah, yeah, and we we just yeah we're looking for some way to to control it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to see that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but yeah, I mean that's one of the fun things is that you can. You can kind of move them in any, any direction, you know? And so right now, let's see if I can get this. Uh, there's a ginormous parking garage, the biggest parking garage you've ever seen in your life in San Diego at the, at the airport. And um, uh, a partner of ours, uh, Nick Hoffermas, is uh, the other artist on this. Uh, he has a relationship with E-Ink. E-Ink is the company that, uh, if you have a Kindle, uh, that's E-Ink. And uh, so these are special, you know, never done before pixels where uh, they actually have solar power on them, and they also have um, um, uh, a, a wireless remote on it as well. And so uh, you can just basically put these things up, and uh, it's not basically, it's sort of a real pain, in fact. So this is actually happening right now, and uh, it's a real big pain, but uh, it, it's going up. And let's see if I can get this thing to work. Um, they basically become little pixels that, uh, Man, sorry about that. There we go. Um, that you can turn on and off. Um, what's that? No, it's not PC. It's just it's um, whatever e ink is. I, I can't Elect uh, electromagnets, basically, very small. But if you have a lot of them, then uh, you can do things like this with it. And so, hopefully, that's going to be up uh, by the end of the summer, and uh, should be should be really fun. <laughs> Um, Possibly. Sort of the, well, I mean, if, if, if you go through the airport, I'm, sh I'm sure there's plenty of things flashing around. So, yeah. So the, these are pretty subtle, actually, when, when you're out in the, in the sun. So. Sort of the inspiration behind um, the pattern and the uh, animations behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is in San Diego, um, but in, it's right next to the San Diego. has a big naval base. Um, and at that naval base was some of the testing for a very early form of camouflage uh, for the military that were, were called dazzle ships. Um, if you haven't seen those, you should look them up. They're very interesting. A uh, big military ship painted sort of like a, a zebra on drugs. <laughs> They're very uh, interesting, but the whole idea is, is that um, high contrast elements um, get, make it very hard to kind of perceive the overall shape. And so uh, we sort of connected that place um, to the idea and then thought about how could we carry that idea of this high, high contrast elements and changing the shape of a facade um, using this technique. So uh, finally, uh, being in the positions that we are, we get lots of strange emails and, uh, you know, about aliens and all sorts of fun stuff. And, and, uh, but uh, had a friend of ours, uh, his name is Ivan Amato, and he's a science writer, and he wrote me up and, and he's like, Dan, there needs to be a museum of awe, and you need to run it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of busy right now. You know, I got stuff to do, and, and I kind of <laughs> pu pushed aside. And then, uh, then he, <laughs> he like called me up, and he was like really hounding me, and he's like, there needs to be a museum of awe. And you know, finally, I let it like get into my head of like, yeah, there needs to be a museum of awe. Wouldn't that be cool? And it'd be awesome to be the person who runs it, right? <laughs> And so, uh, so I called David up, and I was like, David, want to start the Museum of Awe? <laughs> you know? Yeah. What do you say to a call like that, right? So uh, first of all, like, what the heck is the Museum of Awe? Um, is it actually a museum? Of what is awe exactly? How do you elicit awe? Is that something that actually can be done? It's kind of a high bar, you know? Um, what does it actually mean? And so we started thinking about these things, and um, it really kind of started to provoke a whole number of questions. But the one that we're most deeply interested in is, is how can we find a truth in that that we can use as a starting point? Is, is something that, um, like a way for us to connect with the idea of awe in the Museum of Awe. And one of the things that we thought of is that 
you know, much like everybody here, we have a very deep interest and fascination with the way things work, right? The things that are around us, whether it be sort of art or technology, not technology, but um, just sort of our, our universe, right? And we thought, well, that already is the Museum of Awe. What if we were born into the Museum of Awe already, and we just forgot because we're too busy? We have too many cell phones. We have too many job responsibilities. We have too many things requ required, drawing us out from the attention that's required to actually connect with sort of the beauty and the mystery of things that are all around us and the importance of interacting with that beauty and mystery so that we can be inspired to try to find out what it's about, you know, um, and also to connect with each other. And so we thought, well, that is sort of a good starting place for us. We believe in that. What if we don't create the Museum of Awe? We're living in it. And what we want to create are ways for people to experience it through art, uh, through technology, through food, through dance, through all of these different types of, of methods that are, are sort of means to connect to the beauty and mystery that is, is around us. Yeah, so you know, we, we have little kids, and like a three-year-old, like everything's a museum of awe, right? And so our job is to help everyone else see the world as if, as if they're a three-year-old. And so we're trying to figure out, well, what does this really mean, and what's it sort of like? And we thought, well, maybe it's like an art museum, but it's not pretentious. Um, sometimes I get laughs at that one. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, it's like, maybe it's like a science museum, but instead of facts and figures, that it's really about sparking curiosity. And maybe it's like a theater, but instead of being in the audience, you're actually on the stage, and the musicians and, and the, uh, the actors are actually interacting with you the whole time. And, and so um, the thought is that it's not a museum that you go to in the normal sense that this is where the museum is. Uh, they're actually pop-up museums, and they're in places that you would least expect. So maybe an abandoned building. You know, some, maybe it's in a big skyscraper someplace that you wouldn't expect it to be in, like a business park. Uh, maybe it's in a salt mine, you know, some place that you just like bump into and wow, that's, that's there. And, and the, the subject matter can, can range. It can be anything from like the mysteries of, of outer space, like, you know, a lot of things that we've been showing here. Or maybe it's actually the, the things that are actually maybe a little bit more interesting is the mystery and the awe of the things that are like in your kitchen cupboard, you know, it's right back there. And you, if you looked at it in the right way, you know, there actually is awe there and, and uh, all the way to the, the human condition because no matter what the news has to say, you know, we believe that, that humans have an amazing capacity to love and care for one another. And whenever I've seen a human sacrifice themselves for another human when they didn't need to, that, that always brings out awe and wonder to me. And, and so the, the purpose and our goal is that when you leave the Museum of Awe, that you are reminded of what a gift and what a privilege it is to be alive. And uh, we'll see what happens in this little box over here, but this little box is sort of something that, that uh, has always been that remembrance for us. And uh, so let's see, what's going on here? Is it, it hasn't broken yet? That's great, okay. So um, what I have here is a really simple little fish tank, like from Petco uh, for $15. And so um, what I have here is um, there's a bit of felt there in the bottom. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill it up with isopropyl alcohol. And it has to be like 99.9%. .9%. It can't be like 70%. It's got to be super high. Uh, because the other has water in it. And uh, you want just pure isopropyl alcohol in it as much as possible. Why the alcohol or why, or why the whole the thing? I was curious about why that percentage. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because the rest is water. So, so I, think I, got it, I think I got it pretty well in there. And uh, down here, underneath, inside this box, I have some dry ice. And uh, so this is super cold. Don't touch it. I'm going to put some more isopropyl alcohol here. I'm going to stick this thing on here. And then it uh, needs to sit for a while, do some things. And then you also want to, if possible, make it a little warm on top. This is a, a beautiful little 
tool here. It's just a heating pad. And then I'm gonna put a cam or a, put a, a light on it here. And, uh, and if it ends up working all correctly, you guys can come up here afterwards and, and see this. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Cool. So, wrong direction. There we go. So inside of here, there's a little fog. It's about that high. There's no fog up here. It's just, it's just fog right down there. And it's not so much the fog that's really interesting. If you, if you watch, it's a little hard to see with this one, but you see little streaks. You see little streaks. So those streaks have an amazing story because they're showing you particles that have come from exploding stars. So millions of years ago, star exploded, another star exploded, and, and eventually uh, some of these particles go out all over the place, and some of them get to Earth, and some of them get to, you know, Seattle, and some of them get here, and then they slam inside this box. And the particles in here, this fog, is just the right size that for a fraction of a second, it proves to us that there's this invisible world it's all around us. And it's not just around us, but it's through us because there are millions of these things that are flying through you and through me at this very second. And if we remember back that our bodies are made of atoms, atoms that used to be in a star. And a star exploded and another star exploded and another star exploded and, and particles, you know, atoms go all over the place and, and some point a bunch of them get big and they get hot and they became our sun and then other particles they kind of became smaller but they they became our planets and then some of those atoms became our trees some of those atoms became plants and animals but it's at this moment in galactic history that some of those atoms have become you and become me. It is a gift and a privilege to be alive. What you do matters. What you guys are doing here matters. And it's what drives us in the morning when, when we wake up and we hear that little voice inside of our head and says, what are you doing with your brief moment in time? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Hood? What do you think was your biggest success in publicizing the JPL mission? Oh, uh, biggest success in, uh, in, in, in respect to what we do? No, I, in pushing their vision of space travel, uh, the oh. moon, Mars, wherever. Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably uh, from the perspective of REACH was those travel posters. Um, they, they blew up and literally went around the world. Once we released them, there was over 1,200,000 downloads in one week of those posters. Um, people have them up all over the place. <laughs> and it, it always kind of astounds us. And, and so I think probably from the perspective of reach and success of communicating uh, the, the potential, and specifically since JPL is related to finding those things, those, those planets around other stars, I would say that's it. Um, yeah. Can you help us with ISP in that regard? <laughs> well, I have an answer to that. And that is um, everything because we, we got a lot of the same thing at JPL. People were like, oh, well, I want a poster for that. I want a poster for this. And then, and then but you know, we have sort of a, a deep belief that everything has the, this unique, special quality to it. And probably something for ISP in finding that unique thing, which won't be hard to find, but that it would be better than that. You know, it's like that is the thing, and it's uniquely yours, you know. And that's, that's sort of our approach to that kind of thing. Yeah. There's another, uh, uh, 
So you said the most reach. So so that was most in the popular culture. Uh, but when uh, when we first got to JPL, we actually helped uh, choreograph this uh, this day long pitch um, that ended up becoming the Juno mission. And so we we you know it's not that we made them win. Uh, we uh, we compete for missions, and that was a billion dollar mission. And um, yeah. uh, but I. I uh, worked with the scientists at the very beginning, and then we um, trying to help them come up with the ways of communicating what they were doing. And uh, then we worked on this big one-day pitch, and uh, at the end of it, they you know they ended up winning. And and um, it, you know again, it wasn't that we uh, wasn't that we made them win, but we made them clear. And so uh, I think it's very easy when you were working on these complicated things to be unclear and confusing. And if you're clear and compelling. Um, Hopefully you have something good to sell when you're doing that, because if you're clear and compelling of something that's not good, you know, that's one thing, um, but hopefully it is good, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, where, where did you go to experience the seashell? Oh, yeah, it's at the Huntington Gardens in, uh, in the Pasadena area. So it's a permanent installation. So it is, uh, well, I guess this is a good time to talk about that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's open until September. And then we're looking for a permanent home for it. So if anyone knows of a permanent home, that this would be great. Uh, um, well, the speakers are waterproof. I just yeah, want to let you know. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's yeah, not a so problem. We're, we're looking for a spot. So. We, we already have a center up here for Yes, yes. I know. That is so awesome. It's still there? Good. I'm glad. I, 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 I lived here for eight years, so um, uh, I miss, miss it up here. So uh, yeah. Uh oh. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, um, that thing actually had a lot of. So yeah, um, uh, did we if did we or what if we did something with the Fibonacci series within that uh, that uh, conical shell? So that shell actually had uh, a couple of requirements that were put on the architect. One is that um, those speakers had to be in the exact spot that they were at, and so that was very specific. And the other was that we needed to have a um, uh, it had to be fifty percent transparent. The, the walls, so you had to be able to see through it because otherwise the sound would bounce all around inside of there and it would get really confusing. You wouldn't be able to tell exactly where the sounds were coming from. And so um, the architect at first was like, what do you mean we got to put holes inside of our thing? But uh, actually that, that, um, uh, that pattern that he has is really beautiful, uh, but it also it, it, it's, uh, represents, if you look at the North Star and you have a long exposure and you've seen those images of stars all swirled around, that's, that's what that comes from. And so, um, so I'm sure that um, the Fibonacci series uh, is, is somehow integrated, but we also had like practical you know, things that had to happen for the piece to work. Yeah. It was based on a seashell, and so that's yeah, close, it's close, to, that's enough. close yeah. to the natural pattern. I don't think it follows it exactly, yeah. but those natural uh, number sequences are, are really special to us. Just always get us thinking. Yeah. Uh, this is a real-time projection, right? So, um, <laughs> so right now, let's see. No. No, yeah. But if you... Yeah, so if you, if you were to come up here in, uh, in a minute here and we were to turn down the lights more, uh, you would see it, so... It's yeah. the same trick you put on for a cooking show, yeah. right? You know, You'd be like, like we, and we put it <laughs> together, and then it's look at that, it's right out there, yeah. So, yeah. but just for the just for the purpose of being able to show you, um, but afterwards we would invite you up to come and see it as it's developing right now. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they are muons. We talked about muons a little bit ago. So, so they are muons, and, and the, you don't actually see the muon. You see the streak of the muon. So it's a lot like uh, seeing a wake of a boat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there, there are lots of different uh, shapes and pathways, and sometimes they're not muons. Sometimes they're, they're something else, and depending on if they go, if they're straight streak, or sometimes they have other types of patterns and stuff like that. So maybe you... You can tell what type of radiation it is depending on the line, if it's a curved line or if it's a straight line. It could be uh, a radius, um, uh, 
sorry, gamma rays or alpha and beta radiation. Yeah, this is like the subatomic decay, the ionization of the decay of the subatomic particle. I know some are longer, but yeah. longer yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, yeah, they, just the fact that they're there and, and you know, super inspired by the idea of systems and, you know, here they are, they're part of a, of a system, they're all around us, they've been around us throughout our entire history, um, but I'm not sure that we know exactly how they affect us in a positive way or somehow maybe too much as a negative way, but, but um, this idea of the, the nature of the things that are there that we don't perceive that have an effect on us pretty cool and I've yeah. been really inspired by your work. It's great. Yeah. So, yeah, we've been thinking so, about that. Yeah. So, uh, so he's asking the, the refraction piece with the light and the water, uh, have we tried to make it responsive in some way? And so sound is a way of doing that. And like you turn on different, uh, different pitches of sounds will create different kinds of patterns. And, and uh, in this particular case, that wasn't sort of the, you know, the idea behind it, but uh, we, we love those. Uh, you, you were yeah. doing it with your son the other day. Yeah, really we, cool. we sort of consider that whole project an ongoing experiment because uh, where we ended up was, was right for that place and time, but it opened up so many questions for us of, of how to move the water and the effect of um, the, how to change the refract, choreograph the refraction and what can initiate that and what it can look like. It's, well, you know, we, we just are continuing to play with that. Yeah. Planet Hope? Oh, Planet Hop. Oh, yeah. So if we could, okay. So, so um, the, it was called Planet Hopping, and so it was. Oh, yeah. uh, it was sort of you, you wanted. You were the one who came up. Yeah. With was that. it? Tw it's uh, twelve parsecs. I think it's be forty light years. Yeah. Is that right? So, um, in I guess the scale of time of like the speed that we're used to traveling, it would. I don't even know. Like a very, very long time. But you know what's funny about that though is because um, one of the things we loved talking we so Sarah Seeger who's the, actually was really cool because she was what initiated all the poster project in the very beginning because she was going to come to JPL well she was visiting and this is right when right before the release of this discovery of Trappist came out and she came up to our studio and she sat down with us and was talking about you know um, this whole thing and uh, what it would be like there and what was we were just sort of fascinated by all the information she had and the cool thing was is when you talk to you know astrophysicists and people who are working in that area, that's a very short distance for them, you know? And when you think about it from like the human scale of what we're used to doing, uh, they're like, oh, it's 12 parsecs, yeah, 40 light years, it's just really close, really close. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> close. So, um, so yeah, integrating those little tidbits of information in there for, for like people who don't think about that all that often, um, it just, it feels kind of fun, you know? But um, I guess it's close enough to um, study a lot over time. So, yeah. Great. Anything? Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you.